um, it's May 17th, it's our Board of Education meeting. We're glad you're here. And well, could you please call the roll? Ms. Arnold? Here. Ms. Hunt? Here. Mr. Morrison? Here. Ms. Regatta? Here. Mr. Taylor? Here. You have a quorum. Please stand for the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight, it is my distinct pleasure to recognize Ms. Constance Little as she has been awarded the State, Regional, and National Director of the Year for 2018 from the School Nutrition Association. So, Connie, I'd like you to come up and join me. Be here tonight. Uh, the School Nutrition Association is a national, nonprofit, professional organization representing over 57,000 school nutrition professionals across the country. It was founded in 1946, and its members are dedicated to making healthy school meals and nutrition education available to all students. This award recognizes the extraordinary contributions of school nutrition directors who manage effective school meal programs and provide healthy and appetizing meals to students. Connie celebrates 21 years as a member of the School Nutrition Association and 25 years with Beaver Creek City Schools. The last eight years as supervisor for our student nutrition department. In that role, she manages the National School Lunch Program, a $2.3 million budget, average of 13% free and reduced population, and 48 staff members across 10 buildings. This award adds to a list of many professional accomplishments for Connie, including school nutrition mentor, past president of the School Nutrition Association of Ohio, advisory board member of the USDA's Institute of Child Nutrition, and multiple publishing <coughs> contributions to the Student Nutrition Association School Nutrition Magazine. Connie is also a proud alumni of the Ohio State University. <laughs> The National Director of the Year Award was created to recognize school nutrition directors who exhibit an extraordinary commitment to their school meal programs. Connie certainly exhibits that every single day. Some of the specific criteria used for this award include maintaining the quality of the program through student interaction, menu planning, and a commitment to serving nutritious, tasty, and well-balanced school meals effective oversight of all aspects of the food service operation including budgeting staffing training marketing and community outreach specific to beaver creek city schools some of connie's accomplishments as supervisor include switching our schools to a new point of sale and prepayment system saving the district more than forty thousand dollars annually through tedious evaluation of staff hours she developed labor matrices for every student nutrition position over the past eight years to enhance labor efficiency, securing over $38,000 in grants, including one for the creation of the Beaver Creek Breakfast Club in the high school that increased student participation by 15%. She partnered with and earned five grants from the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, presenting nutrition education and farming to over 3,500 students and families. Switched the district from magnetic menus to web-based interactive system 
that promotes the district's delicious menu options and nutritional content. A training program for her 48 staff members called A Trip Down Yellow Brick Road Learning the Meal Pattern Using the Wizard of Oz Story Concept. She helps her staff learn the protein, grain, fruit, vegetable, and milk requirements for each grade level. <coughs> Annual refreshers are part of this so everyone stays sharp in understanding and implementing the school meal regulations. Promoting our national school lunch program to our community. Through volunteer work as a judge for culinary events at the Ohio State Fair and working with the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation, promoting through school lunches things like the Power of the Pumpkin and My Plate 3, where she focuses on nutritious and balanced meals. We are grateful for all, of, all that she provides to students, staff, and community, community here in Beaver Creek. We are so proud of Connie and appreciate the attention that this recognition also brings to Beaver Creek City Schools and our student nutrition program. Connie has played a major role in Beaver Creek City Schools' success and also in the success of our community. In July, Connie will be honored during the Red Carpet Awards ceremony in Las Vegas at the School Nutrition Association's annual national conference. Over the past two years, it has been my pleasure to get to know and work very closely with Connie, and in that time, she has demonstrated time and again all of the things that have earned her this award. Personally, I have been impressed with her dedication to the students, her staff, and her craft. The student is always the center of our, of our circle. Connie has said that time and time again, and if you ask any of her staff members, they will, they will recite that right back. The student is always the center of our circle. She continues to push herself to stay current and learn new skills and approaches to provide better service to all of her customers. She's always giving credit to her team, and her team is great. I appreciate her sharing the credit, but also a reminder of who created that team and all of the effort that she has put into making that team great. She has created a culture in the student nutrition department that is willing to do whatever it takes to be successful through her years of dedication to the details. She takes all of her responsi responsibilities very seriously. She has demonstrated great expertise in all that she does, running the student nutrition department as its own business and meticulously tracking supplies, food cost, labor cost, waste, and overall profit and loss. Her work in securing grant money and using it to market the student nutrition department is second to none. You can see her in the buildings marketing the power of the pumpkin, celebrating the Ohio apple harvest, Spud Spectacular, Founding Foodie Fathers, the magic of milk with dairy cows, Banana Bash Week, and many more. Her enthusiasm for kids and nutrition know no limits. It is a privilege and a pleasure to work with you, Connie. Thank you. This award is so well deserved and the cherry on top to your outstanding career here at Beaver Creek City Schools. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, I'd like to say thank you to uh, the Board of Education. You've always been there for me whenever I come up with an idea. You're there to support me. I appreciate that so much. And to all of the, uh, uh, the teachers, uh, the students and their families, thank you for allowing me to uh, serve you through the, through the years. It's been my absolute pleasure. And it just thrills me no end to bring this award to Beaver Creek. <coughs> it uh, puts us on the map. And uh, uh, I'm very, very proud of, uh, uh, to be able to, to bring that to, to our hometown, Beaver Creek. So. Uh, thank you very much once again, and I truly appreciate this great honor. Okay, our next presentation, I'll turn it over um, to Mr. Sweeterman, but I would like to kind of tell you something that I've noticed over the years. I know everybody can tell I'm a marathon runner. And when I walk in, everybody knows just what marathon runners look like. Yeah. <laughs> I actually do run marathons, but I, I just I'm not the skinny guy like Mr. Morrison. But anyway, um, you know, one of the things when you have run marathons a number of times, you see two different people, even though they're the same people that are in the race. You see 
people who are at the starting line and they're excited and nervous. And when we get to August, we will see people who are excited and nervous. There'll be brand new teachers coming into the district. And then you see at the end of the race, you see people who cross the finish line and they're crying, they're emotional. Um, sometimes they're limping across, some are crawling across, um, some are sprinting across, um, but all of them are excited that they cross that line and, and family are there to celebrate. Family is not there at the beginning. Family is there at the end. And, um, and they have a different smile. There's a smile on their face when they start and a totally different smile when they end. And tonight, that's the smile we have in our room time for those that have crossed the finish line. They are smiling. Some are crawling across. Some are uh, running across. They're all running across. Um, but what's amazing is, you know, a marathon, some, some can do it pretty quick. I take my time. Um, but some of the... Along the way, it's the story that gets told throughout that. And um, what's amazing is I think the, the men and women that are sitting before us tonight that are going to be recognized, they have not only made their story, but their stories will live on uh, for a long time to come. So I just want to say congratulations to our retirees, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Schweder. Thank you, Mr. Auden. That's a uh, fantastic board members. I was glad to be here this evening. This is definitely uh, my favorite board meeting. Um, uh, each year when we have the opportunity to recognize uh, those who are retiring at the end of this month. Uh, we will recognize other retiring members, uh, staff members in June and July as we recognize our uh, retiring members in the month in which their retirement is effective. It just happens to be that school ends in May and we have our most of our retirees uh, at this time of year. Uh, we're going to start this evening. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, our individuals um, and uh, read a proclamation from the board concerning their service to our district. Tonight we're going to be recognizing uh, both classified and certified staff members and their service. So at the meeting um, with the, of the Board of Education, when your resignation for the purpose of retirement was accepted, the following resolution was also adopted. Whereas the Beaver Creek Board of Education has received notification of the retirement of these professional and classified staff members, Susan Hedlund, Kay Black, Cynthia Burke, Barbara Lance, Deborah Pollard, John Sternberger, Ruth Owens, and Kathy Youngs, and whereas the Board of Education wishes to publicly recognize and commend them for their outstanding contribution during their combined 180 years of dedicated service to Beaver Creek City Schools and community. And whereas, through their efforts, the quality of the support rendered to the district students, staff, and administration in the performance of the school's mission has greatly been enhanced. And whereas, these educators and support staff members leave an outstanding professional and personal record, which will serve as an exemplary model for all to follow. And whereas their presence, influence, and contribution have helped to make Beaver Creek City Schools a better place. Be it resolved that the Board of Education, School District Rec uh, Administration hereby accept with regret these resignations for the purpose of retirement and publicly express to these individuals its sincere appreciation for their outstanding careers in our schools and we wish them all health happiness and a long and contented retirement so with that we will introduce our supervisors who will then introduce our retirees and speak on their behalf our retirees then will have a few opportunities to say a few words if they wish with us uh, we have for our retirees this evening a copy of the resolution that i just read uh, an activity pass so that you can come back and always uh, come to any Beaver Creek event free of charge in your retirement and a plaque honoring um, your, your dedication to our school district. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce Mr. Todd Scott, our uh, supervisor for buildings and grounds and transportation for our first recognition. Mr. Scott.
I'm not texting. I've made a few notes on my uh, cell phone here to make sure I don't mess things up too bad. Um, first of all, congratulations, Connie. What a great honor. Thank you. I'd like to introduce to you Mr. John Sternberg. John, will you come up? John is married to his lovely wife, Carol. They've been married for 56 years. Yeah. Or they have uh, a... <laughs> yes, <she does. laughs> uh, they have one child. They have two grandchildren, a grandson and a granddaughter. Um, John worked as a salesperson in the restaurant equipment business. So Connie, maybe you've crossed his road before, I don't know, for 30 plus years. Um, John, I want to tell you, John is a beautiful person. I can't, uh, I can't express enough, John, how much we'll miss you. We came, I would come to work sometimes, and uh, I don't know, about once every two, three months, there'd be this little envelope laying on my desk, Mr. John Sternberger to Todd Scott, and there'd be some kind of little note just thanking me and uh, just telling me how much he appreciated working here. So, great person. The ladies in the office, I can't count the number of times I come in and there'd just be a pot of flowers sitting there. Yeah. It was just John's little way of bringing it in to kind of brighten things up a little bit. So, John, we really will miss you. I'm getting a little bit emotional because you know, I've become pretty good friends. You'll notice tonight um, I didn't bring flowers. I, didn't bring flowers. <laughs> I don't need it. But I got a little story. So I thought I had a better gift. When uh, the district hired Mr. Uh, Nick Beerhoff as an assistant superintendent, about two months into it, I learned that Mr. Sternberger met Mr. Beerhoff every Wednesday at 11.30 at Wednesday, just to talk about things. Our yeah. gourmet restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Nick would tell me all the time how much John would brag about how great of a job I was doing. I really appreciate that. So my gift to you tonight is, is at 11.30 on Wednesdays, and we'll be there every chance I can be. And I hope that you'll come, and dinner is on me. Okay? I'll free. Ms. Joelle Mangan, the principal of Fairfield. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, it is truly my pleasure to call up Mrs. Barbara Williams. Barbara has um, served at Beaver Creek, in Beaver Creek City Schools for 25 years. 
And Barbara has been all over the U.S. as a teacher and principal educating our youth. Her impact on our students is profound. Barbara works tirelessly to ensure that each of her students feels loved and supported. One great thing about Barbara is that if you were ever in need of materials for teaching, buttons, <laughs> essential oils, and even an iron, yes, an iron, Barbara had it in her classroom. We will miss her beautiful smile and her warm, caring ways. So congratulations on your retirement. Give me the opportunity to work here. Um, it's been a wonderful 25 years. I love every moment of it. Um, there have been some tough years with kids, but there's also been some huge rewards. And uh, you've helped me make a difference with a lot of different people. but it is still a great place to live and learn. <laughs> um, it is difficult to say so long to someone that has been the heart of our Fairbrook family for such a long time. Kathy has worked long hours for many days to meet the needs of our students as well as our staff members and their families. Anyone who knows Kathy will recognize her infectious laugh and this will be missed by all. Although we know you will miss us, we hope you will enjoy every minute with Corbin, gardening, and looking 10 years younger since you are finally able to sleep in. <laughs> so thank you, Kathy, for everything you've done. I just want to say thank you to all of you. 26 years, it's good. And I want to thank all of my Fairbrook family.
Great City's goals for hiring me 28 years ago. Um, it's been a blessing in my life. It hasn't just been a career, and many of you who are teachers know it's an identity. It's your own identity that you look at day after day. Um, I want to thank my school family who have always been supportive of me. Um, I've been through their marriages, their divorces, their births of the first children, um, their first homes, and even their, some of their children's graduations. And um, I couldn't have done it without them. Um, they will be my family forever. Uh, I just want to thank everyone, and it's been just a wonderful uh, career for me. Thank you. Sue Hedlund, come on down. <laughs> you get these, but don't go too far because I'm going to need them back tonight for my wife. <laughs> elegant things I wanted to say about Sue, but as I stand here and I reflect back on my experiences with her, I can tell you one thing about this woman. Uh, she is all about kids and all about heart. She's the kind of teacher I wish my own kids had. Uh, she's inspiring, she's wise, she's kind, she's patient, she's everything you would want to be. <laughs> she's lovely. <laughs> and she's funny. <laughs> we are going to miss Sue so much, but we wish her the best. Uh, she's going on to, to bigger and better things, and we'll always find something to do to serve others. Uh, so Sue, congratulations. Thank you all very, very much. I need a shout out to Kay because I consider myself a stay-at-home mom with six girls. I was home for many years. And when I decided to go back to work, they said, if you will be like Mrs. Black for being an OK teacher. <laughs> and the last thing I have to say, if I thought I was going to go out and kind of ease out this year, when I looked at my class list and I saw Chloe Otten, Andrea Ferguson's daughter, and about six or seven teachers, kids in my class, I thought, oh, I'm probably going to have to kick it up a notch. <laughs> district now uh, for going on 16 years I think uh, so she's been around a while the thing about Sue is she is so passionate about her craft she she really enjoys trying to in, embrace a healthy lifestyle and trying to teach the kids how to live a healthy lifestyle and beyond that she's actually the nurse to the staff I can't tell you the number of times I've walked by the clinic and I'll see someone in there and she's like you know doing this or taking the blood pressure or something like that well, what most impresses me about Ruth is that she is always striving to do better. And she's always striving to find a, a newer, better way to reach kids and to promote a healthy lifestyle. So we are going to miss you dearly, Ruth, but we wish you well. you got a big cabin up in Michigan, I know. She's going to be heading to a lake house there. So uh, we hope you enjoy your time, and thank you very much for your service to us.
And now I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Todd Bandit. Deb Pollard, would you please come up here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Deb, I'm going to have to warn you. I was told this was a roast. <laughs> so speech is a little different than everybody else. Where's Buddy? Make sure you have something in your hands next week. <laughs> it is a, an honor and a privilege to be able to represent Ferguson Hall and especially our special ed department tonight. As I was transitioning in to Ferguson Hall this year as their special ed supervisor, the former special ed supervisor kept telling me about this really good aid I was getting. He told me many times. And uh, it didn't take very long into the school year for me to realize that she had lied and that we didn't get a really good aid. We had a great aid. We really do. And uh, even though your title may be instructional aid, you have served the role as teacher. You have served the role as friend. You have served the role as sometimes therapist to these our students and especially role model. Um, You've served this district very well for 25 years. You have encouraged our students. You have loved on our students. You've challenged our students. You've cried with them. You've especially laughed with them. And you celebrated their successes. I don't want to let you go. Do you know that? I threatened to duct tape her to a chair one time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we'll talk later, Darren. <laughs> But uh, this is my first year there, and uh, she's part of a really great team. She's a champion for kids. Uh, she's a mother. She's a grandmother. And uh, she's a child of God. And uh, on behalf of Ferguson Hall, I very reluctantly wish you happy time. <laughs> has been a godmother and allowed me to serve with kids that have wonderful potential and you have provided the special education department with many, many tools to allow our students to fly. I thank you very much. I thank my father for raising me the way he did. I wish my mother would. I know she sees it. <laughs> and I thank my family for supporting me and allowing me to love many children. Thank you. Well, that closed that part. I would like to say go ahead and go home if you guys got business to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always emotional. Um, okay, I can get any motion to second to approve the agenda to present. Any discussion? Oh, oh. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Regano? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, and we have, we're looking tonight, fortunate that we have one um, member from our community that's going to speak. Leslie Jones. Trying to establish Owen's place and to get it off the ground and running. 
and the support that the Beef Creek schools have given to us over the years is absolutely phenomenal. From the very first time that you chose Owens Place to be a character education recipient to this year's Community Day in the Park, which was an unbelievably successful event. Um, whether there was a penny raised or a million dollars raised would not have mattered because the opportunity to talk with people in the community and to spread the word about why we need a place like Owens Place where people of all ages and all abilities can come together, can talk to each other, can learn about each other, foster friendships, and get on with their lives. Um, we could not be where we are now without the support of the schools and henceforth, because of that, the support of the community. So on behalf of everybody who is associated with Owens Place and for everybody who will benefit from it from five years ago up until heaven only knows how long in the future, I thank you. Have a great summer. And Gussie, thank you for everything you've done to make this happen. It's a big, big committee and everybody works together. Everybody has a skill, everybody has a talent, everybody has a desire to see this succeed. And that's what's making it happen. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I need a motion and a second um, to approve the minutes for the April 19, 2018 meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Please call the vote. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mr. Vanna? Yes. Motion carries. On to items for board discussion. Yes, we have one item for board discussion tonight, and that is bus purchases for the upcoming school year. And I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Thompson. Good evening again. Um, so we'll start with a little bit of background info. And if you'd like to follow in your board book, um, page 114 is where this information is at. Um, so when you look at our bus fleet, we have 101 buses currently, 83 are general education, and 18 are special ed. We have 89 of those on daily routes, and 12 buses that run flex or spares. Um, field trip season, we use a lot of the flex. Uh, we provide service to 10 Beaver Creek buildings and 24 non-district school buildings. Uh, provide service for approximately 4,000 public schools, 218 non-public, and 227 special needs students. Approximately 1.1 million miles driven every year. Uh, the average age of our bus is 12.3 years. A best practice or recommendation is an average of eight years. So we're well beyond that. Um, we have only 10 buses that are covered by any warranty at all. And after next year's up, we will have not have any without a purchase that are under any sort of warranty. Um, so that puts a lot of pressure on us to keep the buses running. Um, the oldest bus in our fleet currently is a 1992, which is 26 years old. Um, and in this, I'll, I'll talk about 15 buses that we would like to replace. Um, Several of those are 1995, 1996, 1999, so pretty much 20 years or older. Um, a little bit of a history or um, about our previous purchases. In FY15, we purchased four buses. In FY14, we, we purchased six buses, four general education and two special ed. And in uh, FY12, four general and one special ed. So in those six years, we purchased 15 buses. Um, every summer, and it's not really every summer anymore, there is a yearly bus inspection that the Ohio Patrol State Troopers come with a fine tooth comb and go over every one of the buses to make sure it's safe for students uh, for the following year. And again, that used to happen every summer, but it keeps creeping up earlier in the year so they can get all of them done across the state. Um, we have 71 of our fleet of 101 that have already currently passed for next year. So they're stickered and ready to go for next year, which is a good thing. Um, the 
the inspectors come out and do them in batches, so we get nine to 12 of them ready at a time, and they come out and they look at them, and if we have any issues, we correct them and, and move on. So we start with our newest buses first and work towards the oldest ones. And as we've done that, um, every time we get a batch ready, we look at how much it costs to get that batch ready in parts only. Um, typically, we are spending less than $1,000 a bus for those early batches to get them up and running. As the buses get older, it takes significantly more to get them ready for inspection. Um, historically, our maintenance costs <coughs> have continued to rise. Um, and in the past couple of years, they've risen so much that we have about spent our budget and we've had to do it continuously. We never want to do that. Um, so if you look at in an FY16, we spent $376,000 um, on maintaining those buses. And that is parts and out-service repairs only. Um, that does not include our mechanics labor. So the stuff that we're doing in-house, our mechanics labor is not in that number. In FY17, we jumped almost $100,000 to $476,000 to do the same thing. Uh, this year, currently, um, I had I checked the numbers this morning. We have spent three hundred sixty-five thousand um, dollars, and we still have a lot of significant left to spend on those older buses. Um, some of the examples of the current needs with our um, fifteen most costly buses, which are the ones that we are proposing that we would like to replace. Um, a lot of it is rust repairs. When you have any vehicle that's that old, you're going to have to fight rust. Um, wheel wells, rusted rims, doors, fuel tanks, floor or framework, body work, paint work, and the paint work is mandated, safety yellow. It all needs to match, so we can't do a patchwork on it. Um, the state will not allow that. It needs, if we need to paint, we need to paint the entire side of the bus, which gets to be costly, and you have to do the brush repairs and all that goes with it. Um, an example of a price tag for some of those costs, to replace the floor of the bus, it costs $12,920. So when you think about, typically a bus is seventy-five dollars to $85,000 a piece, depending on what you're purchasing. Um, and you're going to put almost $13,000 into repairing that rusty floor. It is. It's not money well spent. Um, so our actual current needs, and these are estimates on our most costly 15 buses. They're not necessarily the oldest, but they're, they're close to the oldest. They are, if they're older in the fleet. And depending on what we did last year, we, we could have put money into an older bus that now is going to be good for a couple years before we run into more issues. Um, you can see uh, bus 20, 52, 55, number 1, number 70, number 61 are the most costly to repair. Uh, bus number 1 has a blown motor now, which just happened in the past week, week and a half. Um, so the number for those six buses to get them ready to pass state inspection is $143,000. Uh, and it would be greater than that when you figure the blown motor in, because that wasn't part of this estimate. Um, and then four more buses, $86,000, and then another five buses, $88,000. And that's an example of these older buses cost a whole lot more, where the buses that aren't as old, that are eight years or less, it's going to be about a thousand bucks ballpark to get them ready to pass inspection. Um, so if you look at the, the cost of those 15 buses um, combined, that's $318,000, $560. 565. So if we replace those, we don't have to spend that money. That is $318,000 get those old buses to pass inspection this year. Next year, they have to pass inspection again. So what will we be looking at then? So looking at all that made it very clear to us that we need to speed up the process of purchasing new buses. Um, so the next question to us was, which buses do we buy? Um, worked with the supervisors of transportation, the mechanics. We had some buses come in that we could uh, demo, and we drove some different buses. Uh, some of the things we looked at, we looked at a lot of different things, had a lot of different com conversation about what direction we wanted to go. 
um, compared diesel versus gasoline versus propane or natural gas. Um, the initial price of the bus, um, diesel buses are typically about $10,000 more expensive than a gasoline bus initial. Um, maintenance cost, a diesel bus to um, keep on the road is about 75 cents per mile. A gasoline bus is about 43 cents a mile. Um, diesel buses uh, with emission changes, there's a lot more pieces and parts that you have to do to get it to pass the emissions test. So there's work after the fact, um, different additives need to go into it, and um, they're, just, they're a lot more complex than a, a gasoline bus would be. Um, so when we looked at that, um, and the cost of fuel, gasoline versus diesel, you can typically get gasoline for 30 to 50 cents less a gallon. So when you look at all those, um, gasoline buses are definitely cheaper to keep on the road than diesel. Um, potential drawback is diesel's been around for a long time. Diesel motors we know are built to last. Gasoline, there's not a lot of them on the road. Um, we did reference checks with folks that do have gasoline buses on the road. Um, and, and that led us to, when we looked at gasoline buses, we looked at the international, we, we looked at all of them, but the international and the bluebird really um, came to the top. Which these are two that we want to think about. Um, the international, uh, we are all used to. We have a lot in our fleet that are internationals, and they're nice buses. Um, I would say probably from a driver's point, which I am now. It's kind of <laughs> <laughs> um, it is. It, it's it's a more comfortable and it, it get, I trained on an international, so it just makes more sense to me. And I think there's a fair amount of drivers out there that would say the same thing. Um, but it gets two miles less per gallon than a Bluebird does. And when you run those numbers for 15 buses. Um, that's going to be a difference of about $32,000 a year in fuel. And that's a lot of money to give up for a comfort. Uh, I feel more comfortable with this. Now, International does not have as many um, gasoline motors. They kind of, they're a little bit behind in the R&D and, and putting money into that. So I think they're going to catch up. But as of right now, we would be giving up two miles per gallon. And that's a lot to give up. Um, so again, we looked at all of those different pieces, um, and we would like to recommend Bluebird Vision gasoline buses, 12 general education, and three special education to replace those 15 oldest buses. Um, we looked at the purchase options, lease to own versus an outright purchase. Uh, lease to own makes a lot of sense in our situation. Um, we don't have the money set aside uh, to purchase 15 buses. It would be about 1.2 million. Um, we can do a five-year lease. Um, we can apply <coughs> even payments. And our last payment, after five years, we own the buses outright. There's nothing else that we need to do. Um, that would be a finance rate of 4.15%. 4 um, so for $258,665 annually for five years, we can make that payment and we can avoid spending that $318,000 to get those old buses ready to go next year. Um, this has been publicly bid through the EPC cooperative. So we're a member of that, it's been bid out. We can shop those prices so we would not have to put it out to bid. It's already been done. Um, the timeline is extremely aggressive um, in talking with the manufacturer. They can have them manufactured by July 17th, delivered to us by August 1st. Um, and as we get closer, that date might change a little bit one way or the other. Um, I think it would be earlier than the August 1st delivery date. But one piece that we need to be aware of is even after we get delivery of them, the state still has to come and inspect them. So that gives us about two weeks from that August 1st delivery date for an inspection so we can have one <coughs> before school starts. Um, 
there is a resolution later in the agenda to, to approve this and move forward with this purchase. Um, and the last piece I want to talk about is planning for the future. We still have work to do. Um, we have to plan for continuing to buy buses down the road after this 15, uh, or we're going to be in a similar situation down the road. Um, the retired buses, those 15, we will put those on a uh, auction, and we expect to get three five thousand dollars each out of those. That money um, we would use to purchase a additional uh, passenger van for athletics and replace a passenger van. Um, it's a 1999 that it had mechanical issues last last week that it was down and we had to send the mechanics out to fix it. So um, it's a need of replacement as well. Uh, this purchase would move the fleet age from 12.3 years on an average to 9.56 on an average. So that's a that's a healthy jump, which is good for us. Um, it's still not where we'd like it to be, but um, again, we'll, we'll plan on that. Um, future steps include right sizing the fleet. Uh, we need to continue to improve efficiencies um, and take a very close look at routing, which we'll be doing for the 1920 school year. Um, and seeing where, where we really need to be. Um, and again, we've got to plan better. Um, we can set the eye aside a little bit at a time, so we've got it ready to purchase buses in the future. So that is background on the school bus purchase. Any questions? I just would like to tell our mechanics that they're clearly doing the market job keeping these buses running. Yes, they are. I wouldn't have a car. Mr. Marshall. Mr. Thompson, thank you for this excellent, detailed, very informative report. I think it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. My question is, does the state of Ohio give the school district any kind of uh, reimbursement or anything to help offset some of these costs? No. No. Okay, so 100% is being borne locally. Correct. Okay. I like to plan moving forward. Mm -hmm. So we're not constantly behind you, you know, I call it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, get I like that we right. mm -hmm. I like that we have a plan going forward. Thank you for this. So um, that 
points to one of the big reasons that we're asking for the levy in November, as you all know, and, and the last resolution is on the report agenda tonight. Um, right here you can see on the red line, that's our expenditures, which continue to stay steadily grow, but the blue line shows that our revenues um, do not grow, and in fact, we keep having these levies that expire over and over, which causes us to keep going back to the voters just to renew old money so that we can stay flat, flat funded. I mean, if we don't renew old money, then we actually decrease in our revenue line in the blue line there. So you can see here, all we're, we've really, all the hard work we're doing really is just to, to maintain a flat line revenue while the expenditures continue to increase, just like at home. Costs go up, but you know, the one thing we have differently is there's no increase. There's no cost of living adjustment. Even like retirees get cost of living adjustments every year. Um, the school district does not get that. So um, we have to start thinking about how to maintain and keep up with our, rep, our, expenditure, our expenditures for the organization. We have to keep the organization going. Um, one of the things that we will recognize later is that we are 75% locally funded. So we will continue to have to talk about levies like this. So even with assuming the renewal of the levy, there's a couple of years in the out years that we have um, deficits. Right there again, just showing the bottom line deficits. Our base, tax base is predominantly residential. So our, our voters are paying the bulk of our local um, funding. And then the commercial and industrial is about a quarter of that. So um, again, we are really dependent upon our taxpayers. Our average daily membership, or the size of our district, we're a little bit larger than our similar districts. And our peer average, probably because Lakota is in there, it kind of throws them up a little higher than us. But most of our peers are about the same as we are or smaller. But Lakota was a larger district. If we look at our similar um, districts, our local revenue per pupil, we're at um, $7,951. And then a lot of these districts not only um, get their local revenue, but they even get more state funding than we do. So you'll see that's a big factor in why we have a lower expenditure per pupil than almost all of them. Even though our revenue is, it looks like it's staying where it's supposed to, but that's local revenue per pupil, it's still only 75%, it's still about 75% of all the money we're getting. Our estimated revenues here, 75% local, 25% state. So you look at the state revenue per pupil, we're at the very bottom. I mean, we are not bringing in very much um, state revenue, basically because we're deemed a, a wealthier district. And versus our state, um, our, our peer group, we're at the very bottom of our peer group as far as getting state funding. And the same thing for federal revenue. Again, our median resident income is one of the large, uh, highest in the area and amongst our um, most similar districts. So that shows the propensity of the state to expect for us to be able to pay for the, um, this, the cost of, of our education. Here we have our number of students served. We are a larger district. That was back in 16, 7,200. We're, I think, over 8,000 now because we are growing. Well, yeah, we're going to get the um, most recent after fiscal 18 is done because this was a um, comparison report that was done for us a couple years ago. The new formula shows that we're on a cap. We have all day kindergarten. Our ABM may go up more, and I think it will. We'll have two biennium budgets in here, and the question is, does the state of Ohio re revenue remain, remain strong, even to continue to bring in the, the level of revenue that we get now? In the past, we've been um, continuing to see less and less um, state revenue. Our expenditures are mainly, since we are a service industry, we're wages and benefits, 82%. And uh, we have our negotiation costs in the you know, um, settlement, agreement settlements, in the forecast all the way through the five years. 
Our expenditures per pupil, again, less than our similar or our peer districts and are right about at the same as the state, the state average. And our students per, per teacher are the highest over our Ohio average, the similar districts, the peer districts. Um, this obviously points to the fact that um, that's a really high return on the investment if you're a taxpayer and if you're a teacher, um, the question would be, you know, is this, is this the best practice? Teacher's average salary. So when you're looking at our expenditures, when we have to go out for a levy, one of the things people want to know is, you know, why can't you live within your means? What's the cost? Well, our average teacher salary is in the lower quartiles. So I wouldn't say that we are out of um, kilter. You look at our expenditures throughout the years that the five-year forecast projects were basically salaries and benefits. And then uh, the small tan line is the uh, contracted services pretty much. A lot of those are fixed costs and overhead costs that you can't control too much. Um, so there's very little opportunity to misspend funds when you're basically getting everything in the classroom via instructional costs and those types of um, needed, very, uh, very badly needed um, expenditures that come into this organization. I mean, I think a lot of times people are, um, not only do they want to support their schools, they want to support us, but they also want confidence that we are spending their money properly. And when you look at salaries, benefits, and you know your purchase services, it, it's basically all going to the classroom people. So I think that's important for everybody to know. Our expenditure per pupil right there, um, we are at the very, one of the very bottom, um, which shows the frugal way that we do operate. And if you look at our peer group, the same thing. Our administrative expenditures per pupil, unbelievable. I think that's a very, a very important um, metric for people to understand is that we do not have exorbitant uh, administrative costs, but we are putting the money in the classroom and that's important for instruction. That's what people want to pay for. So as far as our um, levies are concerned, we do have to increase and ask for you know additional money, and even with the um, levy being renewed, again that just keeps us flat. Uh, the state aid formula, we're not really getting any more. We were on target with our funding projections. The staffing plan, we continue to have committees and cost containment committees inside the district. Greg works with his group in operations. Darren and I work with our. EMIS folks and some of our um, other, with Jason, with our academic people to look at what, um, what do I want to say, what student enrollment's doing at all levels and in the district and where it looks like we will have, we need additional people. We don't just, you know, hire and hire and hire. We really make sure that there is a large need demonstrated via data in order to actually make those increases and Bobby's continuously looking at the special ed costs and um, there's been a lot of data that we've been working on and putting together that shows in the last three years there's just been a large increase in the special ed enrollment for our district and in um, the level of services that we've had to increase and provide via the state mandates so um, I feel like that we are we are we have the story to tell we have to ask for more money but the story that we have to tell is i mean the metrics point to the fact that we are managing properly we are putting all the money in the classroom and we are reflecting the current level of services the expectation the expected level of services that the community wants us to have i mean we're doing all of those things to try and you know, um, reach the student, the full student. So our um, results, the four-year graduation rate, we're, we're higher than everyone in, in our comparison districts, and the state and our peer average, the same with the ACT and the performance index. Um, I just think that that shows that what a great return on the investment or the academic investment that is being made 
is um, really a, a positive for our community. I was talking to some of the folks around here who um, have been purchasing homes in the area and um, I had someone tell me today that in their area, actually, I think in where you live, Bobby, they said that the, the for sale signs don't even go up. All you see is the sold sign. And so I think if you're looking at people who maybe um, don't have children in the schools, it's, you know, why should I support? Because, you know, my I don't have children or my children are already graduated. It's, it's because of um, the benefits that you get in a culture and in a city like Beaver Creek and the investments you have in your real estate. There is a great culture that is um, in our district and in our city, and I think the schools contribute greatly to that. So um, that's all I have right now, and I would take any questions, but we will end the fiscal year June 30th. Hard to believe we'll be starting fiscal year 19 and July 1st. October will be a whole new five-year forecast for us, and um, then the uh, levy will be in November. So we're going to keep tabs on everything and keep you updated.
since the three of us have been driving the buses, it, it's truly remarkable. I think uh, Mrs. Arnold said it best. Um, our mechanics are unbelievable that we have over there. And um, I've had an opportunity really to just get to know those four individuals and I'm, I'm amazed that these buses continue to run. So I applaud them, but this would be a great step forward. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And that would conclude uh, my discussion. Okay. Well, just, just a question. Um, Mr. On what time do you want us there? On Saturday. Uh, it starts at 9, so I believe if we can get, get there by 8.15, we'll be fine. 8.15. 8. <clears throat> okay. So, Tom, I'm not sure. All right, I'll find out for you and let you know. What's that? How many times? How many times? I counted. I did. Because I read every single name. I said, okay, how many of these kids join now? So when I count, I just tell them all up. 582. All right. Okay. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Ms. Arnold? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Ragana? Yes. Ms. Shinkaris? We're on to announcements. We know this Saturday at the Number Center, 9 o'clock, May 19th, graduation ceremony. May 22nd, last day of school for students, early dismissal. May 23rd, staff work day, no school, and next Board of Education meeting is right here, June 21st. And that takes us to board comments. This is hot. Uh, I just want to congratulate Andrew Ferguson um, on her to Coy Middle School principal. Well deserved. We're glad to, to have you leading the charge over there. Um, I wanted to mention Connie Little's award. Connie's one of those people I've, ever since I've been associated with the schools and met her. I've never met somebody who loves their job as much as she does. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, she's so excited about every little thing that she does, which I think is amazing and it's infectious, and that's why her staff is. Um, so highly regarded because she just she leads them with enthusiasm. So I told her that as she was leaving, but I just think that's it's, it's an awesome example of the type of people that we have in our district. Um, I want to congratulate the retirees. Um, two of them are at Fairbrook, where my son goes to school. So um, not seeing Mrs. Youngs in the office is going to be really strange at the beginning of the next school year because she's kind of been a fixture through my kids' time at Fairbrook. So. Um, Definitely going to miss her. And um, the, in regards to the middle school teens, um, I know that there are probably some families out there that this necessarily isn't necessarily a popular decision, um, so we may hear some feedback about that. But um, as a parent of a middle school athlete, I can tell you that it's the right thing to do for kids right now. Um, and the more kids we have participating in athletics at the middle school level, the better job we're going to do preparing our high school teams to be successful. Um, so I think that decision that they made is, is a good one, so that's all I've got. Thanks. This is Arnold. I'm Mel, so you never know what I'm doing. Let's see, okay. Mr. Gilley's going to be next. I'm like, okay, let's go.
difference. Just enjoy life. Have a good this evening. Okay, Mr. Taylor. Okay, well, uh, first off, show choir finale on Thursday? Uh, no, Wednesday night. On the range. Yeah, uh, it was awesome. Uh, show choir. Uh, again, there you go. Last night. This morning? Was no, last night? Yeah, that's too much. You guys to go to see? Yeah. I'm too busy. There it is. Where did they go last night? Uh, but awesome, the, the amount of talent. Yeah, because I was somewhere else last night. Uh, Mr. Inneking uh, puts that crew together. It just is uh, incredible. Also, the um, Luna Volca uh, concert with the uh, Art Orchestra of Wright State a few weeks ago. This is just also incredible. It was an award winning uh, a song that he has. It's also infectious as well. Uh, well, we saw that when oh, they yeah, walked yeah. in last week in the uh, flash mob. Uh, the uh, retirees, of course, uh, having been on that, that side uh, seven years ago, and just uh, reflecting on uh, what it takes to uh, have that kind of dedication. Uh, as an employer, I know that any organization, business or school or anything, is only good as the employees that you have uh, in the service of, of that group. Uh, and to see uh, retiring teachers who uh, exhibit not only the longevity, uh, but the compassion that they have uh, for their students. I heard uh, them being introduced you know, several things came out that uh, the number of lives that teachers touch throughout the year and the compounding effect of that that uh, goes on forever. Uh, putting kids first. Uh, they cherish the memories that they have because the, one thing I found out about being a teacher was I wasn't just teaching, I was learning. And not only did I touch kids' lives, but they also touched my life. Um, being in champions for kids, just an incredible uh, uh, thing. I think that's how you stay in the business that long, is to have those kind, those kinds of things in your mind and that kind of focus. Um, so, enough about that. The uh, career center, just a few things about that. We'll be going on the ballot uh, with us in uh, November, uh, a whopping 1.03. Mill Levy uh, to the intent to build a new school, a uh, new vocational center for Green County uh, to service the seven school districts that, that would do service. Um, their valedictorian uh, is a, a Beaver Creek student. I think maybe they have two valedictorians. They're both Beaver Creek uh, students. So uh, that says a lot about uh, Beaver Creek as well. So we have being on the board at the Green County Career Center is like night and day. I go there on Wednesday and the kind of details they work through and the way that they work through it, especially with uh, things in terms of budgets and things like that, just as a, a, a different way of looking at the, the way that we do it. So I appreciate your, appreciate your efforts. <laughs> so uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to sound like a broken record, so That's okay. I'll keep it short. Um, you know, congratulations to Connie We're not talking to State Award, which would be phenomenal. We're talking to National Award. Wow. Uh, so congratulations to her. Uh, Andrea, uh, I could not think of a better person to be in that position. I've seen and admired your leadership skills for quite some time. You're going to do a fantastic job, so very uh, wonderful to have you there. Uh, all of our retirees, you said it very well, that they put kids first. And I'll tell you, you know, kids are pretty doggone smart. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the eight people that we talked about tonight, we recognize they all put kids first. Uh, and then, of course, this is going to be our last meeting before the kids are done for the summer. And I hope that our administrative team, as well as our superintendent and treasurer, take some time over the summer to relax and get reacquainted with your families because you all do a phenomenal job. So. I met Connie Little when she, she her first job was a valley. So that was, I'll never forget, you know, behind there serving the kids. 
always so happy. I mean, it was fun to take my kids and lunch every day because she greeted them and the kids greeted her and they loved her because you never knew what she was going to say. It was always just so much fun as a teacher. I like going through the line with kids. It's like, okay, this is fun. So we talked about that in her um, retirement party then her last weekend. It was amazing what her staff did. It was the yellow brick road and this entire place looked like the Wizard of Oz. They left literally no stone unturned. It was just amazing. It was a great, I mean, I don't know how you replace the kind of little, like I just say, I mean, she's just amazing. Andrew, congratulations, we love you. We're excited. Thank you for doing what you do for our kids. And they're gonna be excited to have you as their principal now. So thank you for that. And you know, this is a hard night as a retired teacher. Okay, so teachers are our district, are our family. There is no doubt about it. And you know, you may retire from your tree, but you never leave it. Your family is always there. And what these teachers do day in and day out, people just have no idea. They really don't. Unless you're walking in their shoes, you just don't notice. I mean, they are not just teachers. They're nurses. They're mentors. They're parents. They're just a combination of everything. Psychologists. That's what our teachers do. And I know this community really supports and loves our teachers. I'm going to tell you that as a retired teacher, I am still friends. And we still do things with parents out of my classroom. We became friends with them. So, I mean, that's how tight knit the parents and the teachers become in this community. Um, it's hard to replace teachers when they leave. It's like, you know, we've got the best of the best. We just do. We're very fortunate here in New Creek. Our kids are fortunate because our teachers do put our kids first. That's all you hear them talk about. I remember, you know, teachers day after day, let's meet. What do we need to do? How am I going to help this kid out? What, I mean, let's sit down and talk about it. That's all they worry about, how to make kids' lives and how to make kids the best they can be. So you just can't replace teachers like that. You just can't. Um, I want to talk, we had a clergy, Mr. Rod held a clergy luncheon last week. Last week was last this Friday. week, last Friday, yeah. That was amazing. It wasn't, there were like 42 people there. And he has received so many, I just read a thank you card that came, and it made me cry tonight because this clergyman said how special it was and that not, just was a very special day for him and all these other clergy there. Um, they felt very honored to be there. They know that Beaver Creek Schools really cares about them and wants them to be part of our school community. And I understand we're going to be doing more of this. And they're also looking forward to it. So that's, thank you for that. Um, the scholarship awards night the other night, it's amazing what different groups in this community do to raise money for our kids. I mean, it's just one group after the other, $10,000, $5,000, $7,000, $6,000. These groups just handing money out to our kids because they know how important it is for our kids to go on and do something really important with their lives. The community believes in them. That's what's so special about this community. They believe in our school district. They believe in our kids. And that's what makes us so special. So I want to thank everybody in our school district, all the administrators, all our teachers, everybody, for what you do for our kids. I know I say this all the time, but I truly mean this day in and day out. You just keep giving, and you never stop. So God bless you all, and thank you for what you all do. I really mean this, and much at the top. Um, thanks to the administration, our superintendent, our treasurer, everybody out there. Thank you for what you all do. We really, truly love you. You are the best of the best. Um, we are now going to go to executive session. We need a, a motion of second. There will be no action taken after this. Can I oh. ask you to add security to um, executive session? Can okay. Add security. Okay. So, any motion is second to go into executive session for appointment, appointment, dismissal, discipline, motion, demotion, security, or compensation of public employees 
121 policy 22 G1. So moved. Second. Okay. 